of the tongue, and so on. The first idea, the idea of unconscious motivation, um, involves rejecting the claim that you know what you're doing. So suppose you fall in love with somebody and you decide you want to marry them. And then somebody was asked to ask you why. And you'd say something like, well, I'm ready to get married at this stage in my life. I really love the person. The person is smart and attractive. I want to have kids, whatever. And maybe this is true. But a Freudian might say that even if this is your honest answer, you're not lying to anybody else. Still, um, there are desires and motivations that govern your behavior that you may not be aware of. Um, so, in fact, you might want to marry John um, because he reminds you of your father or because you want to get back at somebody for betraying you. Um, if somebody was to tell you this, you'd say, that's total nonsense. But that wouldn't deter a Freudian. A Freudian would say that these processes are unconscious. So, of course, you just don't know what's happening. So the radical idea here is you might not know what, why you do what you do. And this is something we accept for things like visual perception. We accept that you look around the world and you get sensations and you figure out there's a, there's a car, there's a tree, there's a person, and you're just unconscious of how this happens. But it's unpleasant and kind of frightening that this could happen, that this could apply to things like why you're now studying at Yale, why you feel the way you do towards your friends, towards your family. Now, the marriage case is extreme, but Freud gives a lot of simpler examples where this sort of unconscious motivation might play a role. So, have you ever liked somebody or disliked them and not, not know why? Have you ever found yourself in a situation where you're, you're doing something or you're arguing for something or making a decision for reasons that you can't fully articulate? Have you ever forgotten somebody's name at exactly the wrong time? Have you ever called out the wrong name in the throes of passion? This is all the Freudian unconscious. The idea is that we do these things. These things are explained in terms of, of cognitive systems that we're not aware of. Now, all of this would be fine if your unconscious was a reasonable, rational computer, if your unconscious was really smart and looking out for your best interest. But according to Freud, that's not the way it works. According to Freud, there are three distinct processes going on in your head. And these are in violent internal conflict. And the way you act and the way you think are products not of a singular rational being, but of a set of conflicting creatures. And these three parts are the id, the ego, and the superego. And they emerge developmentally. The id, according to Freud, is present at birth. It's the animal part of the self. It wants to eat, drink, pee, poop, get warm, and have sexual satisfaction. It is outrageously stupid. It works on what Freud called the pleasure principle. It wants pleasure and it wants it now. And that's, according to Freud, how a human begins. Pure id. Freud had this wonderful phrase, polymorphous perversity, this pure desire for pleasure. Now, unfortunately, life doesn't work like that. What you want isn't always what you get. And this leads to a set of reactions to cope with the fact that pleasure isn't always there when you want it, either by planning how to satisfy your desires or planning how to suppress them. And this system is known as the ego or the self. And it works on um, the reality principle. And it, it, it works on the principle of trying to figure out how to make your way through the world, how to satisfy your pleasures or, in some cases, how to give up on them. And the ego, the, the emergence of the ego for Freud symbolizes the origin of consciousness. Finally, if this was all there was, it might be a simpler world, but Freud had a third component, that of the superego. And the superego is the internalized rules of parents and society. So what happens in the course of development is you're just trying to make your way through the world and satisfy your desires, but sometimes you're punished for them. Some desires are inappropriate, some actions are wrong, and you're punished for it. The idea is that you come out, you, you, you get in your head 
a superego, a conscience. In these movies, it would be like the little angel above your head that tells you when things are wrong. And basically, yourself, the ego, is in between the id and the superego. One thing to realize, I told you the id is outrageously stupid. It just says, oh, hungry, food, sex, oh, let's get warm, oh. The superego is also stupid. The superego, according to Freud, is not some brilliant moral philosopher telling you about right and wrong. The superego is like, you, you should be ashamed of yourself. That's disgusting. Stop doing that. Oh. And in between these two screaming creatures, one of, you, one of them telling you to seek out your desires, the other one telling you you should be ashamed of yourself, is you, is the ego. Now, according to Freud, most of this is unconscious. So we see, bubbling up to the top, we feel, we experience ourselves. And the driving of the id, the forces of the id and the forces of the superego are unconscious, in that we cannot access them. We don't know. What, it's like the workings of our, of our kidneys or our stomachs. You, you can't introspect and find them. Rather, they do their work without conscious knowledge. Now, Freud develop this. This is the Freudian theory in, in, in broad outline. He extended it and developed it into a theory of psychosexual development. And so Freud's theory is, as I said before, a theory of everyday life, of decisions, of errors, of falling in love, but it's also a theory of child development. So Freud, Freudian theory is now, at this point in time, extremely controversial. Um, and there's a lot of well-known criticisms and attacks on Freud. This is just actually an excellent book um, on the memory wars by Frederick Cruz, which, um, and Frederick Cruz is one of the strongest and most passionate critics of Freud. And the problems with Freud um, go like this. There are two ways you could reject a theory. There are two problems with a scientific theory. Um, one way you could reject a theory is that it could be wrong. So suppose I have a theory that the reason why some children have autism, a profound developmental disorder, is because their mothers don't love them enough. This is a popular theory for many years. It's a possible theory. It just turns out to be wrong. But another way, and, and so one way to attack and address a scientific theory is, um, is to view it as um, just to see whether or not it works. But there's a different problem a theory could have. A theory could be so vague and all-encompassing that, um, that it can't even be tested. And this is one of the main critiques of Freud. Um, the idea could be summed up by a quotation from the physicist Wolfgang Pauli. And Pauli was asked his opinion about another physicist. And Pauli said this, that guy's work is crap. He's not right. He's not even wrong. And the criticism about Freud is, is that he's not even wrong. Um, the issue of vagueness is summarized in a more technical way by the philosopher Karl Popper, who described, who, who introduced the term of falsifiability. The idea of falsifiability is that what distinguishes science from non-science is that scientific predictions make strong claims about the world, and these claims are of a sort that they could be proven wrong. If they couldn't be proven wrong, they're not interesting enough to be science. So for example, within psychology, the sort of claims we'll be entertaining throughout the course include claims like, Damage to the hippocampus causes failures of certain sorts of memory. Or everywhere in the world, men, on average, want to have more sexual partners than women. Or exposure to violent television tends to make children themselves more violent. Now, are they true or are they false? Well, we'll talk about that. But the point here is they can be false. They're interesting enough um, that they can be tested, and as such, they, go to, they might be wrong, but they graduate to the level of a scientific theory. 
Um, this should be contrasted with non-scientific programs and the best example of a non-scientific program is astrology. So the problem with, astro with astrological predictions is not that they're wrong, it's that they can't be wrong, they're not even wrong. I, did my, I got my horoscope for today on the web. Um, a couple of negative aspects could make you a little finicky for the next few days. Okay, I want to watch for that. The presence of both Mars and Venus suggests you want to box everything into a neat, ordered, structured way, but keeping a piece of jade or carmelian close will help you keep in touch with your fun side. And starting this morning, I got from my wife a little piece of jade, and I have been sort of in touch with my fun side. The problem is, a few days aren't going to go by. I said, God, that was wrong. It can't be wrong. It's, it's just so vague. I got a better horoscope from the onion, actually. Um, <laughs> Riding in a golf cart with snow cone in hand, you'll be tackled by two police officers this week after matching a composite caricature of a suspected murderer. Now, that's, that's a good prediction because, because wow, if, it's, if it turns out to be true, I'm going to say those guys really know something. It's falsifiable. Um, arguably, Freud fails the test because Freudian theory is often so vague and flexible that it can't really be tested in any reliable way. A big problem of this is a lot of Freudian theory is claimed to be validated in the course of psychoanalysis. So when you ask people, why do you believe in Freud, they won't say, oh, because of this experiment, that experiment, this data set, and that data set. What they'll say is, it's Freud the Freudian theory proves itself in the course of psychoanalysis, the success of psychoanalysis. But it's unreliable. I mean, the problem is, say, Freud says to a patient, you hate your mother. The patient says, wow, that makes sense. Freud says, I'm right. <laughs> patient, Freud says, you hate your mother. The patient says, no, I don't want to tear like that's disgusting. Freud says, your anger shows this idea is painful for you, you've repressed it from going, I am right. <laughs> and, and the problem is, the same sort of dynamic plays itself out even in the scientific debate back and forth. Um, so Freud, Freudian psychologists, I'm putting Freud here, but what I mean is well-known defenders of Freud, will make some claims like, you know, adult personality traits are shaped by the course of psychosexual development, all dreams are disguised wish fulfillment, psychoanalysis is the best treatment for mental disorders. Scientists will respond, I disagree, there's little or no evidence supporting those claims. And the Freudian response is, your rejection of my ideas shows that they are distressing to you. This is because I am right. <laughs> and this is often followed up. Seriously enough, you have deep psychological problems. <laughs> and now, now, I don't want to caricature Freudians. A lot of Freudians have tried and made a research program of extending their ideas scientifically, bringing them to robust scientific tests. Um, but the problem is, when you make specific falsifiable predictions, they don't always do that well. Um, so, for instance, there's no evidence that oral and anal characteristics, the personality characteristics I talked about, about being needy versus being stingy, relate in any interesting way to weaning or toilet training. And there's been some efforts cross-culturally, to, to go back to the question this young man asked before, looking at cross-cultural differences in toilet training and weaning, which are really big differences, to see if they correspond in any interesting way to personality differences, and there's been no good evidence supporting that. Um, similarly, um, Freud had some strong claims about sexuality for why some people are straight and others are gay. Um, these have met with very little empirical support. And the claim that psychoanalysis proves itself by, being, by its tremendous success in curing mental illness is also almost certainly not true. For most, maybe not all, but for most psychological disorders, there are quicker and more reliable treatments than psychoanalysis. And there's considerable controversy as to whether the Tony Soprano method of insight, where you get this insight and this discovery, oh, now I know, makes any real difference in alleviating symptoms such as anxiety disorders or our depression. Um, this is why there's sort of often sort of a sticker shock when people go to a university psychology department where they say, look, hey, where's, um, so I'm in psych, how can I take classes on Freud? 
Who's your expert on Freud? And the truth is, Freudian psychoanalysis is almost never studied inside psychology departments. Um, not the cognitive or developmental side, not the clinical side. There are some exceptions, but for the most part, um, even the people who do study Freud within psychology departments do so critically. Not very few of them would see themselves as a psychoanalytic practitioner or as a Freudian psychologist. Um, Freud lives on both in a clinical setting and in a university, but Freud at Yale, for instance, is much more likely to be found in the history department or the literature department than in the psychology department. And this is typical enough. But, despite all of this,